I just told Mark a few minutes ago, he's our guest speaker today. <laughs> just kidding. Mark Lawrence, as everyone knows. Mark. Um, thank you. Um, no, um, President Sanger was not kidding. I, I, I feel so bad for you guys that I am the speaker. Um, and <clears throat> I also apologize for my confusion. I, I was under the slight misapprehension that I was speaking to a lot of undergraduates. So I didn't prepare anything, sort of like when I was here writing a, a, an English paper. But um, I had lots of fun random references to sex and drinking, which I feel like um, stuff like I was going to tell them that when I was here, we had a pub and we could go and get beer and pizza because the legal drinking age was 18 and I felt so bad for them that they couldn't drink. But I, I know you guys drank, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that joke. And um, also, I feel uh, a little uh, sort of out of my element addressing you guys. I am not a graduate of, I mean, I'm an undergraduate uh, of Binghamton, but I, um, as close as I got was dropping out of NYU Law School in my second year, which until this moment was really my proudest achievement, um, movies, movies and television aside, and, I, and I, I, I do mean that. But I am thrilled and honored and uh, amazed to get this honorary degree, and um, when you were mentioning the privileges, I was a little disappointed to find out that it came with no self-prescription privileges. Um, I thought the, a pad would be at least cool, but I'm still, I'm still happy. And um, standing here, it was 35 years ago that, that I graduated, and I'm just reminded of how incredibly comfortable these outfits are. And they're really, in thinking about it, I'm standing, I wasn't going to talk about this, but they should give these out when you get here. Because this is the perfect Binghamton ensemble, I think. It's like all weather gear. It's like the, it's like the, the ponchos that you get at Disneyland or the stuff you buy at Harry Potter World when it starts to rain. And, um, and everybody always looks great in black. And also, they cover everything, which I know when I was here, for the four years I was here, I don't remember doing laundry. Um, I'm sure I did, I just can't remember this specific incident, nor do I remember any of my very close friends doing laundry, and one of them is currently head of psychiatry at one of New York's major teaching hospitals. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to talk for, uh, I think I was told to talk for about 10 minutes. Somebody said an iPhone, and just, just let me know. Um, I, I got here in 1977, and it was a very different place. It was, uh, it was only eight years after Woodstock. Um, a lot of the incoming freshman class looked like roadies for the dead. Uh, a lot of torn tie-dye t-shirts and big bushy Jerry Garcia beards. Uh, many of the men were even more extreme. <laughs> and and it, was, it, was a, it was a revelation for me coming from uh, just a, a kid from a, a small town in Long Island, Old, Old Beth Page, um, and coming here and just meeting so many different people from different backgrounds and, and different cultures. Uh, I met um, conservative Jews. I met Orthodox Jews. I met <laughs> Jews who kept kosher all year long and Jews who only kept kosher during the High Holy Days. It, it, it made me realize how provincial my upbringing had been. I had a very cursory religious upbringing. I, I, I did go to a temple. I was, the, um, I was the starting point guard for the temple Beth Elohim fighting Irish. <laughs> and so coming here was, was pretty amazing. And because it was such a hippie-ish time and, and the counterculture elements were still here, I took the tour, the freshman orientation tour, and one of the highlights was the health food co-op. I don't know if it's still here. It was in what we used to call the union of, up above where the, where the bowling alley is. And it was packed, and somebody had put a piece of whole grain bread out, and a piece of organic cheese on top of that, and another piece of uh, whole grain bread on top of that, and was standing at the window holding a solar panel, aiming a beam of light at this potential sandwich. <laughs> and you just, you just felt the excitement building in the room. And it just, it just made us feel like there, there was nothing we couldn't do and we could change the world. And it was in, by the way, whoever ordered that, it'll be ready right after this ceremony. 
and, and they, they also want your drink order. Um, I don't know where you guys live because you probably, graduate housing is different. We, I lived in, in Newing. Did anyone live in Newing here? Probably not. <laughs> That's exactly the right expression. Um, it's, it, uh, Newing now doesn't, it's sort of like a Ritz-Carlton. When we lived there, if you were, I, I actually, I don't know how to describe it, so I'll just, if you were living in a triple, did you ever see um, Apollo 13? If you, if you were living in a triple in, in Delaware, it was exactly like that with gravity and about an equal chance of survival. Um, but. But if any of this sounds bleak, the truth is that my four years here were, were, were um, probably the best time of my life in a lot of ways. And what I've decided to do professionally was inspired partially by you know, what I read and, and heard here, but just the entire collegial atmosphere of this place and my desire to make sure that there was never any situation in which I couldn't wear shorts. And I, I managed to carry that out from, from my time here. And when I do think about what was special about Binghamton, it really comes down to three things for me. Maybe four, no, it's three. Uh, um, uh, one is the city itself. I know that sounds insane, but once you get over the, the obvious similarities to Paris, I, <laughs> I always felt that there was something magical about this place. Um, I, it, it feels like a Norman Rockwell painting with the color drained out. But I, I, I mean that as a compliment. That didn't come out because when you look more closely, the color's there. And, um, you know, one of his, America's greatest writers, Rod Serling, grew up here. And he talked about what a profound influence this place was on him. And, and it probably, again, will not sound like a compliment to say that the Twilight Zone was inspired by Binghamton, but it was. Um, <laughs> And, um, and I loved it, and because it was off the beaten track, it felt like ours, and uh, off campus felt like it belonged to us, and it was, so I, I thought that was kind of magical. Um, the second reason is, is the education I got here. I know it sounds like a cliche, but I met some incredible professors and, and, and teachers here uh, who really inspired my love of literature and, and writing. Um, and one of them who uh, can't be here today, I just want to mention, his name is Professor William Spanos, and I'm assuming you guys have never had the, the um, pleasure of attending his classes, but if you can read some of his books, um, what he uh, taught us was, uh, he taught us a lot of things, and like most geniuses, it was hard to um, understand everything he was saying, but uh, what he really taught us was not to accept the conventional wisdom just because it is the conventional wisdom, and I think that's a, a very, very true thing, whether it's interpreting Moby Dick or on a larger scale, it was you know only 60-something years ago in this country that segregation was the conventional wisdom, and uh, six or seven years ago that the conventional wisdom was that gay marriage was unconstitutional. Uh, as recently as two years ago, American Idol was still the number one show. So I think, I think it's important to really subject the conventional wisdom to strong inquiry and, and, and not just follow the herd. Unless you're going to go work in Hollywood, in, w in which case it is the only choice and you should definitely not express any of your own opinions. And the final thing is, is the people that I met here. Um, a lot of my closest friends were from here, uh, a group of guys I was incredibly tight with, mostly because no girls would talk to us. And we were also, I will say, times have changed. We were not uh, enlightened in terms of gender politics. We used to label women uh, largely because they wouldn't talk to us. For, for example, there was a girl in a, taking a philosophy class in the lecture hall who did incredibly well in all of her tests and wouldn't speak to any of us, and she became the MSG for Mean Smart Girl. There was also the GWBG. She was the George Washington Bridge Girl. She lived in Fort Lee, so you knew if she asked you for a ride home during break, you were going to have to stop off on your way to the island, and it was something to avoid. And, um, finally, sort of the height of our Algonquin roundtable cleverness was the JG, which stood for Jewish girl. We knew, we knew this because she ate in the kosher kitchen. And um, she was uh, really pretty and really nice. And she is here today. Her name is Linda Sunesinoff, uh, class of 83. She was a psychology major, which came in really handy because we've been married for, um, oh, you guys, you know. I know, I know what you're thinking. That's so nice, and he writes these romantic comedies. I only say this stuff to her in front of groups of a thousand people or more. Um, 
Um, but, but she is here and, uh, and uh, she's an, an amazing dance educator now and she forced me to have three children um, <laughs> who are amongst my th uh, three favorite people in the world. Two of them can't be here because they're playing with their band. Check them out online, lawrencetheband.com. Um, you won't be sorry. Linus is here, he's 12, the best combination of pitcher, Star Wars fanatic, and aspiring screenwriter. Um, some of you may remember, you guys may, my parents, Ann and Lee Lawrence, they showed up for Parents Day in 1977, which was supposed to start at 10 in the morning. They showed up at 7, parked in the mud, and required the entire freshman class to push them out. And my sister, uh, Julie, an amazingly talented artist, is here, uh, almost got killed with me on a ride home from Binghamton, so incredibly courageous of her to come back. And her wife and, and my sister-in-law, who I uh, love, is an incredibly talented massage therapist, and given what you guys are about to walk into, I would definitely get her card. And uh, on a closing note, um, mentioning family, I only have this to say. Um, in Hollywood, we do a lot of stories about kids who are underappreciated by the parents or not loved enough by their parents or undervalued by their parents or stigmatized by their parents and those are valuable stories and I know I'm trying to do it to my kids so they'll have something to write songs and screenplays about but um, what we what we don't do as much and now that I'm an old person standing here talking to you is talk about uh, how desperately parents most parents anyway love their kids and and um, and look and want love and affection and, and respect from them. And I'm assuming that there are some people in the audience today who helped you guys go here and get through and, and get a degree from one of his, uh, America's best universities. So uh, if you can, just you know, say hi to them. Don't completely ignore them. Give them a hug. Um, slip them a 20 bucks. Whatever, whatever, whatever feels right to you because they, they must have been instrumental on your path to success. And, and if success doesn't come and you wind up in their basement in your underwear obsessively binge watching Game of Thrones while clutching some lotto tickets, um, it, will, it will really, really ease that transition. But I don't think that's going to happen to you guys. I think the world is your oyster, assuming it's still here pending the whole climate change thing. Um, fix that, by the way. I know there's people out here who are smart enough. Please fix that. And um, I hope you have a great journey and all the luck in the world to you. And you guys actually do re look really great in black. Thanks. <laughs>